now watching the Pan-African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want. Unity. Consciousness. Our culture. Our spirituality. Our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa. Brothers and sisters, this is Onyx, and I want to share a piece that I wrote a few years ago called Immaculate Misconception. Sister J was kind enough to allow me to put this on her page, so. Here is Immaculate Misconception. From motherland to foreign land, from beaded necklaces to chains, from Africans to Americans, from warriors to slaves, from ritual to religion, from culture to Christ. From my shade to amen, they said Jesus died for our sins. How can we believe their white God died to save our black skin? Knowing they hate us the way that they do, they never worship a God they didn't believe hated us too. We choose to worship their God. We worship it more than they do. Yet our ancestors suffered, their masters tortured and beat them, made them bow to their knees and surrender to Jesus. But we don't honor our ancestors for the blood that they shed. We sit in church crying with Christians because Jesus suffered and bled. We don't look to our history for truth, we look to their Bible instead, but it's time for truth to be spoken, something's got to be said. Something's got to be said, it's time we tear down their lie. Something's got to be said, it's time we do more than survive. Something's got to be said, for it's time we remember, we're not African Americans. Blacks, colors, or niggers, we're African people who strayed way too far. We're African people. We deny that we are because flowing like poison their religion has spread, growing like cancer by our ignorance fed. We've been manipulated, lied to, deceived and misled to the point that our ancestors' voices are dead. It's time we connect with our ancestors, disconnect their religion. Our ancestors were Africans before they were Christians. Our ancestors were Africans before they were slaves. It's time we start living and thinking the African way. In spite of what we've been taught, it's time to forget what we learned. It's time for truth to be spoken, but for truth to be heard, something's got to be said to cause our thinking to change. Somebody's got to say something. I've got something to say. Before Adam and Eve, before Abel and Cain, long before Noah's Ark, before the floods and the rains, before Abraham, Isaac, Moses, Joseph, and Jacob, before Samson, Delilah, Goliath, and David, before the prodigal son returned to his home, before the children of Israel for 40 years roamed, before resurrection, redemption, rebirth, and religion, before Christians created chaos and division, before a biblical fairy tale was accepted as true, before the testament all, oh, before a testament knew there was Osar and Aset, Heteru, Geb, and Sebek, Heru, Seka, Tehudi, Amen, Hera, Kahuti. And Ma'at were the principles guiding our ancestors' lives. Not a religion whose God was hung on a cross left to die. Our ancestors listened to spirit and by spirit were led. Not by a book trimmed in gold, words of Christ written in red. Our ancestors walked in and lived in a spiritual dimension beyond Jesus Christ's understanding or their God's comprehension. By the time a virgin named Mary gave birth to a savior named Jesus, our ancestors had constructed the Sphinx and built the pyramids of Egypt. Their white folks stole us and sold us and told us surrender. They called us unworthy, called us ungodly sinners. They told us our God was a heathen and we practiced the pagan religion their God commanded. They practiced a form of cannibalism. Taking holy communion in remembrance of his death, they drank their God's blood. They ate their God's flesh. They arrested innocent women, put them in prison, charged them with crimes they'd never committed. In the name of their pagan religion, they told lies so convincing when they put these women on trial, no one would defend them. These women healed those who were sick before modern medicine existed through a method of healing which we call holistic. Yet these daughters and wives and mothers of children were unjustly tried and unjustly sentenced.
And it was the Christians who preached, Thou shalt not bear false witness, who falsely accused them and convicted them as witches. It was the Christians who judged them and sentenced them to die. It was Christians who tied them to stakes and burned them alive. It was Christians who said they were evil and followers of Satan. It was the Christians who murdered those women in Salem. And the same Christian who started the witch, witch hunt crusades wrote the Bible they lived by. His name was King James. Meaning the God of the Christians allowed his words to be written by hands washed in the blood of innocent women. And in this Bible we trust that never acknowledges us. Not from the first word in Genesis to the last word in Revelation does your Bible mention our people, our history, our nation. Not one chapter, one verse, not one scripture, one sentence. So how could, could their God have created Africans in, in his image? Because if their Bible is true, Africans never existed. The Bible says by his power, Jesus raised up the dead. The Bible says by his power, 5,000 people were fed. The Bible says by his power, Jesus turned water to wine. He healed those who were crippled, gave sight to the blind. By his power, he opened deaf ears and the mute he may speak. But where does it say by his power, he unshackled our ancestors' feet? Where does it say by his power that he set our ancestors free? Where does it explain why his power still ain't set us free? We're not free as a people because we're still believing their life. They don't need to shackle our feet. Their religion has shackled our minds. I don't care what you believe. They believe in a God with white skin. And if it's their God that you're serving, it makes no difference to them whether we're saved or we're slaves. It really don't matter. Because in their minds, we're still serving a white man as our master. So if you believe you're a Christian, if you believe John 3.16, if you believe their God is your God and his death set you free... Then why did your God perform miracles and free the children of Israel never even attempted to free your African people? Why did your God curse the Egyptians and take their riches away and let the Christians get wealthy selling your ancestors as slaves? If their God, who's your God, loved you so much he died, then explain this, this to me. Tell me why your God freed the children of Israel from slavery by killing all the firstborn Egyptians. But when your ancestors were in bondage and saved by the Christians, when Christian hands locked their shackles and Christian hands held the keys, why didn't your God kill their firstborn? To set your ancestors free. And if hanging Jesus on a cross was to save you and me, who are our ancestors saving as they hung from the trees? If, be, if Jesus saved us by suffering in, in hell for three days and three nights, who are our ancestors saving by suffering each day of their life? If beating Jesus with a, with a whip was to save us from sin, who are our ancestors saving as whips to open their skin? Who are our great grandmothers saving as they were raped and violated? Who are our great grandfathers saving as they were stripped and castrated? Why were our ancestors tortured? Why were our ancestors slaves? They suffered far more than Jesus, but not even themselves could they save. So how can we instead of sin and spit in our ancestors' face by serving a God who ignored them as they screamed for his mercy and grace? How can we instead of sin and call Christians our sisters and brothers when they snatched our African babies out of the arms of our African mothers. How can we as their descendants bow down and give praise to the God of a people who stole our language, our name, stole our culture, our heritage, our spirit, our will, then in our face shoved their Bible and told us thou shalt not steal. How can we as their descendants, the God of our ancestors, reject but give our glory and honor and praise and respect to a cross they burned as they slip ropes around our ancestors' necks? How can we as their descendants believe Christianity could save us when the Christians who preached it were the ones who enslaved us. Peace, brothers and sisters. Thank you for letting me share my peace. All shades, coconut brown, chocolate smiles, melanin crowns, sepia souls, sienna eyes, copper coils, cinnamon thighs, Honey-hued haze, brown butter lips, chestnut cheekbones, earth-hugging hips, coffee all shades, coconut brown, chocolate smiles, melanin crowns, sepia soles, sienna eyes, copper coils, cinnamon thighs, honey-hued haze, brown butter lips, chestnut cheekbones, Earth hugging hips. One thing that keeps me puzzled, despite having studied finance and economics at the world's best universities, the following question remains unanswered. Why is it that 5,000 units of our currency is worth one unit of your currency, where we are the ones with the actual gold reserves? It's quite evident that the aid is in fact not coming from the West to Africa, but from Africa to the Western world. The Western world depends on Africa, 
in every possible way since alternative resources are scarce out here. So how does the West ensure that the free aid keeps coming? By systematically destabilizing the wealthiest African nations and their systems and all that backed by huge PR campaigns. Leaving the entire world under the impression that Africa is poor and dying and merely surviving on the mercy of the West. Well done, Oxfam, UNICEF, Red Cross, Life Aid, and all the other organizations that continuously run multi-million dollar advertisement campaigns depicting charity porn to sustain that image of Africa globally. Ad campaigns paid for by innocent people under the impression to help with their donations. While one hand gives under the flashing lights of cameras, the other takes in the shadows. We all know the dollar is worthless, while the euro is merely charged with German intellect and technology, and maybe some Italian pasta. How can one expect donations from nations that have so little? It's super sweet of you to come with your colored paper in exchange for our golden diamonds. But instead, you should come empty-handed, filled with integrity and honor. We want to share with you our wealth and invite you to share with us. The perception is that a healthy and striving Africa would not disperse its resources as freely and cheaply, which is logical. Of course, it would instead sell its resources at world market prices which in turn would destabilize and weaken Western economies established on the post-colonial free meal system. Last year, the IMF reports that six out of 10 of the world's fastest growing economies are in Africa, measured by their GDP growth. The French treasury, for example, is receiving about 500 billion dollars year in year out foreign exchange reserves from African countries based on colonial debt they forced them to pay former French president Jacques Chirac stated in an interview recently that we have to be honest and acknowledge that a big part of the money in our banks comes precisely from the exploitation of the African continent in 2008, he stated that without Africa, France will slide down in the rank of a third world power. This is what happens in the human world. The world we have created. Have you ever wondered how things work in nature? One would assume that in evolution, the fittest survives. However, in nature, any species that over, is over hunting Overexploiting the resources they depend on as nourishment, natural selection would sooner or later take the predator out because it offsets the balance. At the age of seven, my family immigrates from Zimbabwe to Aotearoa. I pass through customs, but my culture is made to stay behind in the classroom. I am afraid my tongue will beat back to its African rhythm, be concussed by fear, have amnesia, turn all its memories to dust. Yesterday I was African, today I am lost. Maybe I was blinded by the neon sign of opportunity, failed to read the fine print which read assimilate, or go back to where you came from. I have been led astray, like Eve to snake, like promises of wealth to the prodigal son. I am a child of the diaspora, a common thread amongst my people in the fabric of what displaces us from our homes. Sometimes it is by choice. Most often it is not. To be a child of the diaspora is to battle two tongues, be forced to trade one for the other, so much so that my articulation of the English language now tastes like the unbirthing of my country. When I travel back to Zimbabwe to reconnect with my roots, I feel I am a jigsaw piece of the wrong puzzle. 
Jino chikisa kuwa munu asinga ziwe nyikangari ya kepe kutanga. It's an emptying feeling to become foreign to a country that was yours to begin with. I am beginning to forget the taste of my own language and home has become just a memory. So home is a concept which feels somewhat elusive to me. While I'm a resident to Aotearoa, coming from an immigrant family, I'm in a position which pushes me outside of my social and cultural comfort zone. And so, like many immigrant families, my parents migrated in search of quality education and success for their children. And when I reflect upon how race affected me through all of that, I realize that at some point I began to believe that in order to attain those aspirations which my parents desired for me, I had to assimilate and assume the values and behaviors of New Zealand culture and therefore neglect my own, which were inherent to me as a black Zimbabwean. And unfortunately, that's a common mindset shift of many ethnic minorities. And I believe the power to re-empower those marginalized communities lies in the hands of our educational institutions. And I'll provide you with an explanation. In New, in New Zealand, Māori students are falling behind on every measure of educational outcome. Secondary school level retention rate, school leavers achieving NCA level two, and the rate of youth involved in education or employment. However, those students who are attending Māori immersive schools actually achieve higher on all fronts, NCA, university, and employment. It's clear that systemic bias and the enduring legacy of colonization is behind this ongoing disadvantage of Māori people. And it is an obvious and reoccurring issue that students who belong to minority groups tend to feel as though they don't belong in an educational context because there are lower expectations of them. In such a multicultural society, never has it been more vital that our educational institutions place an emphasis on history, culture, and language. Because it is no secret that when a student feels as though they belong in an educational context, they perform better. And I truly believe we can eradicate these educational inequalities if we cultivate culturally flexible minds and provide all students with the assurance that they have both the responsibility and the right to be there. A powerful novel titled Decolonizing the Mind speaks of the writer's time in colonial Kenya. It describes how at the time, violence was a means of physical subjugation, while language was the means of spiritual subjugation. So what would happen is, if you were caught in the classroom speaking your native tongue instead of English, is you would either be physically tortured or you'd be publicly humiliated. And that was a really critical part of the suppression process, right? that the language of those being oppressed was dissociated from them. And what's particularly frightening to me about that is I see these same kinds of patterns echoing in today's society, particularly amongst our Māori community as they have to live in fear of what will become of their home when it loses its language completely. Poet Pages Matam describes language as being both a tool for communication and a vehicle for culture. And I find that to be such a beautiful description because language is saturated with history, culture, and memories. Language and words are powerful tools that we can employ to share our different worldviews and perspectives as we come from different ethnicities. Because I believe unity is derived from a better understanding of one another as people, right? So the best way I know how to sh share the perspective of those I represent as a black immigrant woman is through my writing. So I make poetry and I decide to send it to the man who sat behind me on the train last week, who had the audacity to touch my hair without asking. I didn't say anything, which is crazy because I almost always have something to say. <laughs> but in that moment, like my split ends, my mouth was almost too dry to speak. Luckily, my hair, my hair speaks volumes. Tangled and twisted, there are stories in these curls, stories of a mother, father, stamped with a number, marked as objects, sold as property, stories of my ancestors who were shackled in cages, displayed in zoos, the same way you stroke me like an exhibit in a petting zoo, it's twisted and it's tangled, but there are stories in these curls, a beautiful possession of my history's oppression, and you look at me like I am Medusa's child. Cursed. I'm making everyone blind to my self-worth and for years I tried to strip myself of this curse with the potion of chemicals, 
Despite the burn of sodium hydroxide on my scalp, the smell of burning flesh which filled the room, I was hypnotized. At the prospect of having straight hair cascade this broken body of insecurity, hoping to put myself back together with glued in weave tracks, causing receding hairlines as I mentally recede back, back in time to a time of my ancestors' inferiority, to a time of no authority, forever believing that I was the target minority. And you can't tell me to tame this mane because in fact you are the lion. And in this jungle where racism runs wild, I am your prey, you are my predator, devouring my history, leaving me so raw that my own flesh builds a grave for me to lie in. I'm buried deep in my roots. And I understand that I may be dead, but God, can you rehumanize or systematically dehumanize? So I wrote that poem about my experiences with possibly one of the worst forms of racism, internalized racism, which is a system within itself in which minority groups start behaving in ways which uphold whiteness and white supremacy and are unconsciously rewarded for it. And in the words of Dr. King, somebody told a lie one day. They made everything black, ugly, and devil. There are people who truly come to believe these systemic lies that by lightening your skin or constantly straightening your hair, you are drawing closer to success or the ideal standard of beauty. In a multicultural society, we need media sources which accurately portray our multicultural society. Portraying people of color as the standard bearers of intelligence, success, beauty, and professionalism, along with their white counterparts. So dear racism, I am choosing to rewrite the history you gave me because I know the future belongs to those who prepare for it. And you have been preparing me for centuries. Spirituality, nobody can teach it to you. You need to get the fundamentals of any any books, any spiritual system, you can get the fundamentals and then look at inside of you and then determine how you are going to use the fundamental principles to improve your life. But nobody can tell you, you must pray every Friday, you must do this every Saturday, you must do that every Sunday. No, because what is good for you is not necessarily what I need. You may need to go into yourself and meditate a hundred times a day. And even the same person will not need it the same way all the time. You in certain circumstances, you need to be meditating and finding all your forces, gathering all your forces continuously certain days. And in other days you may not even think about it. It doesn't mean you don't pray. Because everything you say, if you're living your own life, if you are who you are and you know who you are and you live working towards realizing your mission in life every sound of it out of your mouth is a prayer every gesture you make is a prayer every dance you dance is a prayer and when you make love with somebody you are praying if you know who you are and this person knows who they are That's right. That's right. there isn't anything that you do that is not a prayer when you know who you are. 